Hello, everyone. I'm Claire Katz. I am professor and interim department head at Texas A&M University. I'm in the Department of um, Teaching, Learning, and Culture in the School of Education and Human Development. And I am facilitating this roundtable on um, does P4C build community? Or alternatively, one, one could ask, how does it, if one just assumes it does build community, how does it build community? So the first thing I want to say is, yes, it builds community. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about um, my own experience with P4C and how I use it to build community outside of um, just doing regular P4C sessions with kids. So in August 1987, I completed the MAT in the Philosophy for Children program at Montclair State University. I was just starting a job teaching in a community college in Baltimore, and I walked in the first day. I put all the chairs and tables in a circle, um, asked the students to open up their books, and then proceeded to lead the community college class, just as I had been trained to do with the sixth and eighth graders um, that I had taught during my year at Montclair when I was working on my master's degree. And I literally did not know any other way to teach. Um, even to this day, 35 years later, um, when I walk into a classroom, if I can move the chairs, if they're not um, nailed to the floor um, in some way, or if there's room in the classroom, I put all the chairs in a circle and continue to lead um, uh, my class that way. So I did the master's degree in P4C long before it was um, well known. And with the exception of um, Gary Matthews, there really weren't many other, if any, um, prominent philosophers who were working in this area. Um, for those of you who don't know Gary's approach, um, just I can easily just say it was summar it's summarized by the title of his second book, Dialogues with Children. Um, and it was just that Dialogues with Children. He picked a variety of different topics, for example, happiness, um, and then pursued those discussions with children of a variety of different ages. The dialogues as they are recounted um, in the various books he published are just quite spectacular and I encourage you to look at them. Um, they provide extraordinary insight into children's capacities for intellectual engagement, um, imagination, and creative thought. He was a really gifted facilitator demonstrating enormous respect for children and their ideas. So over the numerous years um, of um, pro the numerous programs in K-12 philosophy that have developed, what I know now that I did not know at the time that I was doing my master's degree and even for several years after that, was that um, it was on the one hand, it was, and I didn't know this in part because it was really the only program at the time, except for uh, maybe what uh, the University of Hawaii was developing at their center, um, is that the idea of a community of inquiry or a community of philosophical inquiry um, was unique to P4C. Um, where many K-12 program, philosophy programs introduced um, kids to philosophy and introduced kids of all ages, whether it's through an IB program um, or you know, any other kind of um, philosophy program, the unique identifying feature of P4C is the community of inquiry. And here the idea is that philosophy is done with others and that these others are fundamental to the part of, to the experience of doing philosophy. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about the community of inquiry because I believe that this is integral to how P4C builds community more generally. So what is the community of inquiry? The phrase community of inquiry has itself been questioned um, via philosophical communities of inquiry who interrogate what this phrase actually means and how to apply it, which environments fall, you know, fall under it or could be properly labeled as a community of inquiry. So Richard Fox observes that while he worries about moving too far away from Matt Littman's original idea or the developed conception of the community of inquiry and philosophy for children, he also realizes that this is just a fundamental part of movements, that you have a movement, new people come in, as more people come in, um, various parts of this movement then um, deviate from the original way that it had been designed. But although individual practitioners might want to deviate from this original view, it is worth repeating Matt Littman's conviction that it is through dialogue and through community that we advance our philosophies. So the community of inquiry was a unique part of the Philosophy for Children program, but I wanna be clear about this. It was advanced and developed by Anne Margaret Sharp, Littman's intellectual partner, whose contributions to the development and the shape of the P4C program are often not given, the, she's often not given the credit that they are due, that she is due. Sharp's contributions were numerous, um, but her signature contribution was the introduction of the community of inquiry into philosophical discussions with kids. The development of the intellectual community with young people 
um, what Anne believed was that this would be a safe space for kids to offer ideas, to have ideas challenged, to consider different perspectives, to learn how to reason well, to be self-reflective about one's own reasoning process. It is the space where children learn to take ownership and responsibility for their ideas. And most importantly, it is a space where they forge friendships based on a mutual love of ideas and a shared commitment to truth. If you think about it, kids often, you know, kids really of any age, even in high school, don't often forge relationships with each other based on a mutual love of ideas. That's just often not something that um, kids or teenagers um, feel like it's safe to talk about. And then most important to Anne, it is a space where they develop agency and personhood. So the novel idea that was focused on this social dimension of knowledge formation, the pursuit of truth, the process of inquiry, that it's intersubjective, so on and so forth. Matt borrowed this idea from, um, from C.S. Peirce. I mean, he had originally, Peirce had originally um, come up with this idea, but he restricted it to the community of scientists. John Dewey extended this a little bit further to um, educational settings, but Matt actually just sort of systematically applied this concept to the educational setting, thinking of the classroom as a community, a space where this could be a community of inquiry. So for Matt, um, a community of inquiry is not the same thing as a community of scholars um, or a community of learners. Um, and he has um, a kind of a set of um, traits or features that he think identify a community of inquiry. And I'm not gonna run through all of these, but you can find them in the chapter called Thinking in Community, which is in his book, Thinking in Education. So inclusiveness, participation, shared um, cognition, face-to-face -face relationships, um, the quest for meaning, feelings of social solidarity, deliber deliberation, impartiality, modeling, thinking for oneself, um, so on and so forth. The community of inquiry is not simply doing philosophy with other people, rather the community of inquiry emphasizes a particular way of doing philosophy. Um, starting as early as um, elementary school, young philosophers develop particular habits, for example, listening to other perspectives, providing reasons for their claims, considering how one's claims or ideas connect to that offered by another member of the community. And then there's one thing to point out that there are certain features that are certain um, behaviors that would be you know, non-negotiable that you could not do. For example, one is free to disagree, but one is not free to call someone else an inappropriate or mean name. Okay, so um, building on building a community. Um, here's where I think that the mistaken thinking about K-12 philosophy might lie, that K-12 philosophy is only about improving one's thinking skills or you know, just improving reasoning or um, just improving critical thinking and that these are things that we do by ourselves. You know, The teacher asks a question, maybe even a philosophical question, but it's a one-to-one, -one, the teacher towards the student with problem solving. This misguided view might also lead to an underestimation of the value of what a community of inquiry is and what it can contribute to the development of young people. If we focus on philosophy only as that which improves critical thinking skills or aids in the development, the developing mathematical abilities or so on and so forth, we miss the foundations of philosophical discussion, the part that enables us to enter into these discussions, to trust others at the table, to learn from them and to teach them. Philosophy done with a tutor, for example, might not demand the same kind of behavior that philosophy done in a community demands. In a community, you need to be patient, wait your turn, listen to others, process a variety of different questions and comments. These are traits, habits, and behaviors that we could incorporate into many aspects of our lives. Um, indeed, many aspects of our workspaces. It need not be confined only to K-12 um, the K-12 classroom. So here, for example, you can imagine running um, department meetings this way or you know, uh, you know, any other kinds of um, aspect of your workspace. So as much, and I'm just gonna use the philosophy camp that we run as an example, as much an impact as the camp clearly had on the campers, it had just as much of an impact on the staff. Because we were committed to avoiding the lecture format in favor of a more dialogue oriented pedagogy. So the way in which the community of inquiry um, is structured, we couldn't really rely on any specific lesson plan to guide our interactions with our students, with our campers. The result was that often through their questions, that is the campers questions, the campers would push us to think in ways that ha would have never occurred to us. Um, were we trying to engineer student mastery of a subject as is often the goal of regular classroom settings. 
Thus, our role was never to deliver a lesson, but rather to model the kinds of dialogue that make the social process of knowledge production both visible and also available for them to appropriate. So from two of our campers here, are two quotes. As individuals, we brought our own unique thoughts and perspectives to the community, but together through our dialogues, I observed my own attitude and positions begin to develop. Learning from both facilitators and my fellow campers, I acquired new vocabulary that enabled me to explain to others that which I could not previously put into words. The philosophy camp showed me the value of being part of a community of inquiry, in addition to confirming what I already knew about the importance of using cr critical and creative thinking in approaching these complex problems and questions. And then from another camper, philosophy camp taught me a lot of a lot of philosophy and a lot of discussion skills, but the most important lessons I learned were that I was smart and I had good ideas and I offered an interesting perspective and I was valuable to the community that I was part of creating. So returning to the question at hand, um, whether or not P4C builds community and how, it does, but it also builds the very best kind of community. It builds one that's living, dynamic, and growing, and essentially removed from us taking on a life of its own, something that um, whoever you do this with takes us beyond the community that you have formed. Thank you.